to go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So hi, I'm Gemma from Love Yoga Online, and I am here today chatting with Mercedes, which is a huge treat, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your teacher training to chat to us. You're welcome, thank you. (laughs) So I've just got a few questions so that we can get a little bit more of an insight into Mercedes and her life, and as a very busy top UK yoga teacher, just what happens (laughs) in her life, and um, it's really great for us all to have a little bit of an understanding of how things work. Sure. Okay, so let's just dive right in with the oh, first great. question <laughs> about how did you find yoga? How did you come across it? Gosh, that's a lot loaded question. <laughs> um, okay, well, to be honest, I, um, I, I'm Canadian by birth, and I went to California for university, and I think that's probably the first time I ever actually dabbled in yoga. I say dabbled because I literally think I went to City College, took a class that I saw in an ad, and I went to a class and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. It's so not, oh, what is this? Why do people like this? this is so, you know, I was 18 at the time. So, <laughs> so I think it was another few years before I actually got back on the mat. And even then it was actually at a gym. I was part of the gym curriculum. I can't really lie and say it was some, you know, grand studio. It was just because it happened to be on my gym um, schedule and I thought I'd try it. And then I did it again, and I, I suppose like anything, you have a different teacher, different style, different uh, pace, different, you know, just a different feel, and then I just absolutely loved it, and I just started going, you know, weekly, like a few times a week, and just started going quite regularly, and that's where I think I first kind of really just, you know, dove in a little bit more, so to be honest, so it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't anything, you know, too grand, just really a gym, <laughs> a local gym. <laughs> Like to, to make it more interesting. I mean, that being said, I'd always been interested in studying more the spiritual aspects of life in general. I've always been um, spiritual exploration through my body has always been a, an interesting thing for me. But yoga, it wasn't per se necessarily yoga. It was like that was something completely separate. I didn't really see yoga necessarily as the spiritual vehicle um, at that point. It was definitely much more of a physical thing, like a lot of people that's when they first start. And how did you, how did that lead you to becoming a teacher of your vinyasa flow as a style? How did you get there? Gosh. Well, in a nutshell, I mean, I was actually in the music business when I was living in California. Um, so it was a very different uh, lifestyle. And I was uh, doing yoga. I was a practitioner myself. So I wasn't teaching at that time. Um, I did, I was falling in love with it more and more. And I did decide to do a yoga teacher training. But it was never necessarily with the thought of teaching. It was more just to deepen my practice. And it just, you know, in, in Los Angeles, it's kind of the thing to do, really. <laughs> <laughs> it just sort of people did that kind of stuff. Um, and I was one of those people. But I really, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really loved it. And then how, how I made the transition, it was actually very... Um, it was just life happens to sort of go a certain way. Um, so I, I was teaching a little bit here and there part time in L.A., but I was still very much kind of in the, the music industry. And I decided after the um, when the tsunami hit, I don't know if you remember 2004, the tsunami hit that Christmas, so into 2005. I um, I went to go do relief work in Sri Lanka. So I left L.A. for I was really only going to go for a month and I went to go do relief work. Um, and my flight happened to be through London. It was uh, Los Angeles, London, London, Colombo. Anyway, long story short, I ended up staying there for quite a few months, a lot longer than I originally anticipated, almost six months. And originally, I'd only kind of budgeted and, and so I'd be back in a few weeks. And when my flight, when it was time to leave, I had to sort of go back to real life because it was just an incredible experience. It really changed everything I thought about life and you know how we need to live. And it just made me question and informed me in a very specific way. Um, and when I came back to Lo- came through London to take my flight back to Los Angeles, something just stopped me. I just said, I, I can't, I can't do this. I can't go back to to Los Angeles like right now. I needed, I needed to regroup. I, I don't know. Something just shifted inside me that just, it, I just couldn't get on that plane. So I decided I would stay in London for a few weeks. And while I was there, without knowing anyone and not much to do, I decided, you know, wow, well, why don't I teach some yoga? I had been doing it with the other aid workers. I had been teaching it, you know, to the kids, the orphans that we were working with. And I just made sense that I was in London, this big city, and I decided, you know, why don't I teach some of this yoga? Um, and really, the yoga that I had been used to doing was like what we learn in California. You have teachers such as Shiva Ray and sort of these flow-like teachers that on the forest and, um, you know, Sal David Ray was more holistic yoga, but it's, you know, just an amazing flow. Brian Kess, power yoga. 
So it was a very different style than what was happening in London at the time. This was, you know, we're talking probably six years ago now, um, six, seven years ago. And I just had studied, that's all I knew. I'd only kind of really ever been attracted towards vinyasa flow because I've had the freedom that I, I needed and I craved with everything in my life, not just yoga, but it just, it gave me no boundaries. It was, it was unlimitless. It had all possibilities. And so when I, when I decided to just, okay, let me stay here a few weeks. I might as well go and try and teach a bit. <clears throat> very effortlessly and organically, I think because there wasn't a very similar style at the time that I, that I was doing, I just very quickly started getting asked to teach classes. And it really happened like with no resistance whatsoever. It was just like life had just said, this is where you need to be. And when I think there's something that, <clears throat> when there's something that's effortless and really organic and authentic, there's no barriers and there's nothing that stops. There's no, there was no issues and it just, it unfolded and it just, it developed so rapidly. So that's really how I ended up getting more and more into teaching. And I, I end, eventually ended up just staying in London. I never took that flight back. Um, so three months became three years and now I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> well, lucky for us. Well, you are. To go back to sell my car and, you know, get my stuff. But yeah, it took a while. I go back, you know, <clears throat> so. Yeah, that's kind of how I transitioned to becoming a vinyasa flow teacher, per se. That's really yeah. an interesting and inspiring story because <laughs> you hear that when things are right, everything flows. Um, but then sometimes I think it's easy to question, is that really true? <laughs> and it's so great to hear you yeah. that that's, you know, that was your experience. You didn't plan right. it. It just happened. And obviously, you know, you were drawn to be here. You were meant to be here. And... I guess, yeah. I think also too that the, the style, like yoga was in a different place in London. And I think it was really needing, um, a style that was very much so, like, you know, it permeated in California, that sort of power yoga vinyasa flow, but there really wasn't much in London. And I think there was, there was definitely a need for it and there was a desire for it. Yeah. And I think because the desire was there, that's where my place came in. That's yeah. where the, the role for me. And I think that the students decide, you know, how, where yoga is going. I don't think it's this thing where, where we as teachers necessarily decide. I think it's the, the, the demand is there. The students decide and that's where yoga is going to, going to be created, you know, that style is going to, going to flourish. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So quick question now. I know it's something that you've been aware of and having conversations with people about. Um, the various different articles and even books about how practicing yoga could potentially be harmful. <clears throat> could you just say a few words about your thoughts about that and some of the ideas that you've had in answer to that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've been asked this a few times, and I think that basically, if I always respond, I don't think yoga... Um, you know, hurts people. I think that people hurt people. <laughs> I think that we hurt ourselves. I think that we're the only ones responsible um, for ourselves and what we get into. And I think yoga teaches us responsibility. And I think that the injuries happen when people don't take that responsibility, when they feel like, you know, they're going to try something that they know they're not ready to do, but their ego is telling them they need to do it, or they aren't listening to that little voice that's saying, you know, this doesn't feel right. They're basically being directed by their pain, thinking that pain is some sort of, you know, a benchmark for spiritual advancement. So if you think you're harming yourself, you know, you're somehow advancing spiritually. Yeah. Your penance, you know, it's that sort of flagellation, like, <laughs> I'm in pain, therefore it must be something good, you know, no pain, no gain. And I think yoga is the very opposite of that. Um, I think it teaches us to be responsible, and that, you know, essentially this whole talk of yoga can hurt yourself, I think if you really scratch a little bit deeper, you'll see that actually the people that, that, that were injured, a lot of times they probably had a hand in it, where they knew that maybe they shouldn't have tried something, or were in a class that were way above their level, or... They just, you know, I get, I get to see this a lot. I mean, sometimes people come in, I have classes that are billed as level three classes, and I'll have people come in, and they're in their socks, and they just be like, oh, sorry, this is my first yoga class. And, you know, and I'm just thinking, well, why would you decide to go to a vinyasa flow level three class as your first class? But people don't really, they, don't, they think yoga is just this really passive, you know, way of sort of moving or breathing or being and they kind of tried it on holiday and I don't think people really always understand what it is and they get themselves in these situations where then suddenly the ego is the driving force and it's not really, you know, there's no more heart in it and there's no wisdom, you know, there's no clarity in why they're practicing or what they're doing and I think that's really where the injuries come in and I think that's where this 
bad rap that yoga gets that, you know, yoga harms you because, you know, it puts you in this position that blows your knees out or hurts your back. Nobody's forcing you to do that. Yoga doesn't ask you to do these asanas. It doesn't care if you do these asanas or not. <laughs> if we're talking about the physical aspect, it doesn't care. I'm sorry. You owe nothing to yoga. But people think somehow that they have to do these things and they force them about their bodies and their, and their spirit, their, you know, their being into really unmanageable places. And that's where the injuries come, you know? Thank you. That's yeah. yeah, it's really interesting to hear the other side from your perspective as a teacher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so the next question, which is my favourite question, is I know that you are recently a mum. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. And how old is your little one now? She just turned one, actually. Okay. She's one now. Yeah, she one last week. I remember so seeing the videos up. online of you doing some of your practice with your big oh, yes. belly. <laughs> Um, it seems like not yeah. long ago. It must have been over a year ago now. Oh yeah, yeah. She's uh, she's got a great love for handstands and being upside down. So I think <laughs> the two of us for a long yeah, time are doing I'm practice sure. together. So <laughs> we've got Nick here, so, <laughs> and um, she's walking already. She's really? walking and running around, and she's very mobile. So I think that's from just moving her entire life, literally. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you've instilled that in her from a from a little. Uh, fetus <laughs> so how has being a mom and the whole pregnancy process and the birth process and you know what it really takes to be a mom how has that affected you your practice even your teaching I think lots of people are not sure about that stage of life and how it can affect their practice yeah, I think I think like a lot of people. I think I always, you know, I really had um, a lot of notions around pregnancy and not just my practice, but teaching, you know, working because what we do is such a physical, you know, discipline um, that you require. You know, your body is part of it. So obviously, as you're getting bigger, you're less mobile. You know, I, I wasn't really sure before I got pregnant how that was going to work. I really always thought, my gosh, and, you know, maybe, can I do this? Can I be pregnant and still can do doing what I what I'm doing? Um, and I think it really took me by surprise as to nothing really ever stopped in terms of I kept teaching up until pretty much the day I gave birth. I went into labor a few weeks early, but, you know, I was teaching that morning and, um, you know, it was, it was very strange. It's just like, I, I think I had so many no, preconceived notions and none of them actually came true. I never really had to stop doing much. And I, it really put my teaching in a whole other level, I think, where suddenly I couldn't demonstrate, obviously, a lot of the asanas. I still was teaching these level two, three classes. So it was like, how do you convey some of these more challenging asanas that my belly is just not going to let me go in there? <laughs> Certain things were still easy, handstands. Where I stand, just because it, it wasn't a problem for me for whatever reason, you know, the belly didn't get in the way, but other things were very challenging. But it was, it really forced me or sort of pushed my teaching, I think, to another level where it actually was, was a really great lesson for me. I think it really showed me that I didn't need to always be demonstrating, that I had to actually rely more on my ability to um, perhaps, you know, describe or convey an asana and really see people through it. I had to really rely on the kramas, which is the stages, and really walk people through them because I can only stop at a certain stage and then I have to verbally teach, you know, verbally let people know where they need to go. I had to sometimes rely on other students that I knew were stronger practice and maybe they were the ones I used to demonstrate. So suddenly I had to like teach in a whole other way rather than just being able to like, oh, okay, this is what we're going to do now and just do it. You know, it's it was, it was a big, it, that was really the challenge, but what was amazing to me is it was like a freedom. It was like this freedom that I was given, like, wow, there's this other way to teach, and, you know, if something ever happens, God forbid, if I hurt my ankle or, you know, if I'm not so physically mobile, I'm still going to be able to teach. So it was a real peace in that. Yeah. Um, and then the same thing, once I had the baby, you know, again, I wasn't sure, like, how is that going to work? How is it going to how am I going to teach? And then now I have this child. And I think it's just always a lot of fears. I think with, with a lot of women with pregnancy, suddenly in the role of the mom and how am I going to reconcile the two. And it's just one of those things where I really, I was planning to take a lot more time off. And really around sort of eight, ten weeks, it just, it didn't feel right anymore to just solely be at home with this baby. It felt like I needed to get back and teach a little. It wasn't I wasn't going to go back to my full-time schedule, but I definitely was craving just getting back into my own practice as well as getting back to students. And, you know, I think I came back probably a little sooner than I thought, but it was really just, it felt ready. Physically, I had no limitations. I was starting to practice again, and definitely I had to build my strength up. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't like I came right into Chathanangas 50 times, but I definitely felt strong again earlier than I thought to just start getting going. And I think it was really good for both me and my child 
that I had a little bit of that space to go back to my practice, to go back to a little bit of teaching. And it just gave me a perspective, you know, with the baby. I had to change my practice a little bit, mainly because the time of day I would practice, you know, suddenly I was feeding every three hours, I was breastfeeding. So I had to really, you know, even at night, it wasn't like I could just go practice at night and the baby's on the bed because I knew she would wake up quite quickly. And so it was, it was very interesting having to suddenly not be so attached to practicing at a certain time of day yeah. or perhaps as well not doing the practice that I set out to do or I would like to do because of not just time constraints, but just physical, you know, emotionally. You're just, you, when you're breastfeeding, you're, you're just so, you're giving so much. And it's much more tiring than I anticipated. I thought it would be a lot easier. <laughs> but breastfeeding was actually a lot, very, like, taxing. It was quite a toll. But I really was keen to do it. I was intent on doing it. So I had to change my practice because if you do too intense, too much of a yang practice, too much masculine energy and fire, it actually can affect, affect the breast milk quite a bit. Really? Very, it had, I had to again stretch myself in changing my practice to still start gaining my strength back and, you know, getting back into my body, but not in a way that would really alter my primary focus at that moment, which was, you know, to be breastfeeding and have enough milk supply for my, for my daughter. Um, so that really, I really had to shift things, you know, I had to shift things, but, but not to the extent I thought, to be honest. I, I, like I said, I went back into teaching relatively quickly and, it's just kind of worked out, yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, it's worked out. It's, it's just, a great story. <laughs> it sounds really, I, I think a lot of people probably have that same concern, especially if they have an active career, if they're a yoga teacher or anything like that, you know, how is it going to affect me? And when I go back to work, how is it going to affect me? It's really yeah. inspiring and um, lots of hope from it, your story. Yeah. yeah. And I think as yoga teachers, we're quite lucky because, you know, I, I, I was, had other friends that had babies some more time and that maybe some of them didn't go back to work. Some did. And, you know, I felt always, oh, I hate that at four or five months I'd have to go back to sort of a nine to five job and not see my baby from the time she wakes up to the time yeah. I come back. You know, and I felt like, you know, I was very appreciative of the fact that I could go up to work for a couple hours, come back. I could go teach a class, come back. I could arrange some private people around a little bit of a schedule. So, I could still spend time with my baby. And I think that, you know, there was that aspect of feeling very lucky. <laughs> she's, she's saying hi. She knows we're okay. talking about her. <laughs> yeah, it's her meal time now. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, it's, but there is the fear, and I think it's, it's valid. It makes sense. But I think that it's never really what you think, is it? You know, what yeah. it's, when I actually, hey. <laughs> Perfect time. Well, I, just, look, I know yeah. she probably really wants her mama back, so just the last little <laughs> bit was just really to ask you, um, for people watching, where can they come and find you, where can they see more of you, what can they yeah. do with you, can they learn with you and practice with you? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm, um, I'm, I have, uh, four classes a week, group classes a week in London, mainly at Tri Yoga. I'm in Tri Yoga, um, Chelsea and Primrose Hill. Monday nights, Tri Yoga Chelsea, Primrose Hill, Tuesdays, Saturdays. And then I teach, um, on Sundays at Evolve at 11 a.m. So there's a few studios there. If you go to MercedesYoga.com, there's my schedules on there. I'm always updating it. And then I own a health retreat in Devon called Go Town. And that's actually where I conduct a lot of my teacher trainings and a lot, all of my teacher trainings and my retreats. So I do 200-hour yoga teacher training. Uh, it's in the vinyasa flow yoga style, so it is a, a particular style. You know, we do concentrate. Um, we're in the Krishnamacharya lineage, and we do work on sequencing and kramas and all of that fun stuff. So it's a particular kind of style. And, um, you know, I do that a few times a year. It's modular. People can do different modules at different times so they can split it up during the year. And so I'm there doing retreats as well. I do New Year's retreats, you know, this year over New Year's. I'm going to do a yoga retreat. So usually at Yotown, I, I'll conduct some yoga retreats and teacher training there. So a lot of times I divide my, my week between Devon and London. I'm kind of back and forth. Um, and then what we're launching on the Yotown site in the new year is um, some of my sort of tutorials and little classes where people, if they can't necessarily practice with me, I'll have a little kind of sample videos and some tutorials of some of my classes and things I'm doing. So you can always watch the video library yeah. that'll launch next month, and that'll be some of my stuff there. So <laughs> it's possible to find me somewhere. Definitely. <laughs> It'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for your time and your energy and your answer to the questions it's really for me it's so um such a treat to get to ask questions of you know such a fantastic yoga teacher i'm sure that other people that watch this will also 
find that as well. So really, thank you for your time. It's been Thanks wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Take care, Gemma. <laughs> you too. And go have fun with your baby. I will. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks so thanks much. Thank you. Big hug. Thanks.